roll our pulpit over here. I'm not knocking it over. It's like a car, you know. <laughs> All right. Hey, this, um, this pulpit is like God's grace. It's free. <laughs> Didn't cost us a thing. So, all right. Um, our journey through Galatians. All right, this is where we've been for the past uh, few months. Now, it brings us to the, the anthem about which we've been singing and celebrating all morning. And we read it in Galatians chapter 5 in verse 1 where the Apostle Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. For freedom Christ has set us free. In Christ Jesus we declare free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. And it means absolutely nothing to you if you don't know you're a slave. When Moses approached the nation of Israel in Egypt, and led them to emancipation. They followed, even though their hearts were hard, because they knew they were slaves. The brick and the bitumen and the mortar testified to that reality. But when Jesus came to emancipate their ancestors in an infinitely more glorious manner, they said to him, We are children of Abraham, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you can say, you will be made free. The ignorant slave has no need of emancipation. Only those who desire freedom. Let's pray. God, help us not to be ignorant, selfish, stupid slaves. Help us to be a kind of people that know from whom we have been redeemed and from what we have been redeemed and from where we have been redeemed. Help us not to look at this good news of freedom this morning and just scoff at it like it was yesterday's headlines or yesterday's tweet. Help us to feel the weight of glory that is in this declaration for freedom Christ Jesus has set us free. And there may be some this morning, God, that are still slaves and they don't even know it. Graciously open their eyes so that they can see the freedom that's offered in your Son, Jesus Christ. God, help me not to be an ignorant and stupid ex-slave slash preacher that doesn't fully feel the weight of this great anthem of emancipation which you have placed in front of us this morning. Help us to worship over this text with a white-hot fervor that is, that is due to the glory of your name, that, is, that corresponds to what you've done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Help me. I need your help in proclaiming this truth this morning. And help us as we hear and as we listen and as we celebrate all that you are for us in the person of Jesus Christ. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. The freedom of which Martin Luther King Jr. spoke when he said, Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we are free at last, was not the solution to the greatest problem facing him and his contemporaries. The reason for this is because racial equality was not their greatest problem. Sin was. The freedom of which the founding fathers of this country spoke and wrote was not the solution to the greatest problem facing them or their contemporaries. The reason for this is because taxation without representation was not their greatest problem. Sin was. The freedom from ISIS that many people in Syria and Iraq hope and long for and desperately need and that they're desperately seeking is not the kind of freedom that they most desperately need because ISIS is not their greatest problem or their most dangerous threat. Sin is. Racial inequality, social injustice, a cure for Ebola, feeding the hungry, the disarming of terrorists, and the fairness of government are all issues that call for our prayer and our great attention and our hands and our feet. They are issues that must be addressed and we must do something as the body of Christ to the best of our ability about these issues. But they're not the world's greatest issues. 
Sin is. Slavery to sin is the world's greatest issue and biggest problem, and there's only one way to be emancipated, and that's to repent and believe the gospel of the great emancipation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be set tr truly free, free indeed. For freedom, Christ has set us free, and this is great news. There's no greater news. There's no greater news than this. For freedom, Christ has set us free. This news is worthy of a Facebook status from you today. It's worthy of being written on your Facebook wall or whatever you do on Facebook. It's worthy of a trillion perpetual tweets. For freedom, Christ has set us free. But for some reason, we get more excited about National Donut Day than we do Galatians 5.1. Like, it's... Krispy Kreme's giving away a free donut. I better let somebody know. Quick, let me get on Twitter. Or let me get on Facebook. Go to Krispy Kreme and get a free donut. And yes, they're hot and delicious. And yes, they're only hot and delicious when the sun is on. But freedom in Christ Jesus tastes infinitely more delicious than a Krispy Kreme donut. And the hot and ready sign never goes off. It's there for you to have and for you to enjoy. And at no cost, it's free. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Why doesn't this proclamation land on us the way that it should? That's the question. Why is it that when we read the scripture, we just glaze over this like it's, I don't know, a piece of prose written by an author that's not very good? Just, I, one of the reasons, just one of them, there's, there's an infinite amount, is that we, we just don't properly understand or appreciate what it means to be set free in Christ Jesus. And so that's what I'd like to look at today. We're not going to go like we usually would from Galatians 5, 1 through 6. Today we're just going to go Galatians 5, 1, and not even the last part of the verse, not even the ground of the verse. Therefore, we're, we're just going to go, or the inference rather, we're just going to go with the first statement. For freedom Christ Jesus has set us free. What does Paul mean when he says, for freedom Christ Jesus has set us free, or we've been set free in Christ Jesus? The freedom spoken of throughout Galatians is not referring to a freedom from a religious institution or a government power or a particular people group, although there can be implications made and applications made in that area. Rather, it seems that Paul is referring to our freedom from the law of sin and death when he says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Or, or to say it a little differently, the arrival of Jesus Christ into human history, his death, his resurrection and his subsequent ascension marks a new era of redemptive history where people would no longer be under the power of the law, but instead under the power of God's grace. The, the arrival of Jesus on the stage of human events with the cross at the center marks a new era in time, an era of grace. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. People that lived under Moses in the time of Moses up until Christ were under the dominion of the law. But now that Christ has come, a new era of redemptive history has dawned. And it's not marked by the power of sin and death, but it's marked by the spirit of life and righteousness. The cross of Christ, His completely sufficient sacrifice, the declaration of justification that we receive because of His resurrection, forever changes the power under which God's people live forever. In Christ Jesus, we're no longer under the law of sin and death. We're under the law of the spirit of life. So we're under a new power, a new force. Something else holds sway, and it's not sin. It's righteousness that leads to life. So this is what I think Paul has in mind, and I wanted to show you how it accords with Galatians and some of his other writings and even the words of Jesus himself. Okay, so I, this is... The way that this all came about was looking at the context of Galatians, looking at the way Paul speaks about freedom and other similar contexts in his epistles, and looking at what Jesus himself said about making people free. That's how it all came together, for better or for worse. All right? And so we're going to begin in John 8, 31 through 32. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We'll pass you a pew Bible. Um, and that's on page 894 in your pew Bibles. John 8, 31 through 32. And this is a very interesting bit of conversation between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. Um, he goes to people that presume that they are free. 
um, and come to find out they're not. They're not at all free. They need to be set free. And so this is what the conversation is about. And this verse will seem familiar to probably most of you. So Jesus said, verse 31, to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So this is what Jesus says to these people. And it's important to note that Jesus sees the people to whom he is speaking as being in slavery. And that may seem as a given, but we know it for two reasons. The first is that Jesus tells them they'll be set free, which implies that they are in a condition, a current condition or state of slavery. I'm going to set you free because you're a slave right now. And you, if you're not a slave, you don't need to be free. And so that's how we know. That's one of the ways we know. The other way that we know is because of the way they answer Jesus, right? This is their response in verse 33. They answered Jesus saying, and you'll notice this quote, we used it earlier, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And so even they took this, this statement by Jesus to imply that they were in slavery because their argument is, we're not enslaved. We're not enslaved to anybody. We're not slaves. We are offspring of Abraham, which means that we are Free. Now, this is the way Jesus responds in verses 34 through 36. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin, who does sin, it's, 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 it is a present verb, so it's a continual. Everybody who, who walks in sin, who makes a practice of sinning, is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever, so... If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And there are, there are three things to notice from this conversation that are very important. Here's the first. Number one, sin, sin, not the Roman government, not their current social situation, not, their, not the state of their marriages. Sin, sin, sin is the primary problem for Jesus' contemporaries. Jesus is not a political mover and shaker like they want him to be. He's not the kind of Messiah that they want him to be. His kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, his followers would fight. Jesus has a bigger view in his mind of what his purpose is. Okay? And so the greatest need for the people in that day was not a form of government that would make them free, like democracy. It was to be rescued from their sin. And you see that in John 8, 24 when he says, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The, 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 what this conversation, the weight of this conversation that we just read is just made magnificently clear in John 8, 24. When Jesus says, if you don't believe I am he, you will die in your sins. That's what's at stake here. What's at stake in this conversation is people dying in their sins. That's their biggest problem. Dying in their sins. No Savior, no justification, no propitiation, nothing. They just, they just die that way and they go to hell forever. That's their biggest need. And that's our biggest need. That's our biggest problem. And oh, the world is great at making us think we've got real problems, right? I've got big problems, says the world. My house isn't big enough. I don't have a house. I'm renting a place. I'm in an apartment. I'm in a trailer. My, our stuff isn't nice enough. You know, I got a big box TV. Everybody else has got a flat screen. Our looks aren't good looking enough. I don't have a spouse. I don't like the spouse that I have. I wish I could have another one. I wish I had a child. I wish my child would behave. I wish I never had this child. The world will tell you that you have a trillion problems, but there's one problem the world will never remind you of, and that's your sin. The world will never remind you that you are in desperate need of God's grace. It just takes your eyes off the Lord. It shimmers and it sparkles. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride and possession is just it's like a neon light in the, in the strip of a big city. It's boom, boom, come here, come here, come here. And it just and it takes our eyes off off of that which matters. Unless we believe and trust Jesus, we will bear the fruit of our sin, which is death. And Jesus came and he died so that you wouldn't have to bear that fruit. You wouldn't have to live under the power of sin and bear the fruit of death. You could live under the power of the Spirit and bear the fruit of righteousness, which leads to eternal life. That's the first thing that stands out to me in John 8, is that sin is their biggest problem. Number two, sin is not merely something that we do. It is a power under which we live. You see this in John 8 because he says, 
you're a slave to sin. You, you're enslaved to this power of sin. So when you think about sin, it's just not something that you do, even though it is something you do. It's not merely something that you do. It is a power under which you live. And, and we know this because of the way ta- Paul speaks about it. And this is a sampling from Romans, just Romans. Romans 5.21, sin reigned in death. Sin reigns. It's just not an act that's committed. It's something that reigns. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, comma, to make you obey its passions. Sin reigns in you and makes you do what it wants you to do. It's a power under which you're held. It's not just merely something that you do. That's Romans 6.12. This is Romans 6.14. Sin will have no dominion over you. It's talking about what you have now in Christ. When you have... When you have Christ Jesus, sin no longer has dominion over you, for you're no longer under the law, you're under grace. But if you're under the law, sin has dominion over you through the law. Before Christ came and put an end to the law of sin and death by His sacrifice, the entire created order lived under the power of sin that was aroused by the law. The law is holy and it's righteous and it's good and it calls for the right things, But when it's given, the law takes advantage of sin, right, and produces in us all types of lawlessness. That's why Paul says, while we were living in the flesh, this is Romans 7, 5, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. One of the marks of living under the law of sin and death is that even the commandments that call for what is holy and good do not have the power to affect the human heart to love what's holy and what is good. The the law that was written on tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, law that was written on tablets of stone, when it was given to the people, it was met with hearts of stone. That's the problem. The The nation of Israel didn't even respond the right way to God's law. Instead of being broken by the holiness of the God that the law images forth, they say, all that you have spoken, we will do, and then commit to make a golden calf. Just right in that, boom. The heart was the problem. To this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to keep His law, is what we're told in the book of Deuteronomy. When a holy and good law is met by a hard heart, what is born from that union is what, this is just for example, this is an illustration, is, is either one of two lions. There are two lions rawr, that are bore from this union of law and sin. The first lion is lawlessness. The lion of lawlessness is what is produced when the law of God is met by a hard heart. It's a, it's a, law, it's a lion of rebellion. It doesn't even seek to submit to the will of God. This law that calls for what's holy and righteous and good, sin, piggies back on the law, uses the hardness of our heart, and creates in us even more covetousness than was there before. The second lion, which is the lion that probably most of you have to deal with, considering that you thought it was important enough to come to church this morning, maybe not, is the lion of legalism. Those are the two responses, lawlessness and legalism. Lawlessness shows a complete disregard for the law of God and the holiness that it requires. Legalism is the opposite effect. It takes this law from God that's holy and that's righteous and that's good, and instead of responding to God in childlike dependence for help to walk in His statutes and to obey His rules, it responds like the rich young ruler. I have kept all these things from my youth. What do I still lack? the law of legalism. God gives us a law that's meant, to, that's meant to show us that we need redemption and we say, oh, look at this. I think I can keep it. I'll just try harder. I'll just do more. These two lions come from the same place, even though they seem extremely different. A heart of stone that resides in our flesh. The source of the problem of super-religious people and irreligious people are all the same. They don't trust the Lord. Irreligious people don't trust the Lord to satisfy their every need, and so they sin rampantly. And super-religious people don't trust the Lord to save them through Jesus Christ, and so they work like the devil to be saved. Both hearts don't trust Jesus. 
This brings us to the third observation from John 8, and it's this. In order to be set free from the lions of legalism and lawlessness, the lion of the tribe of Judah had to die. (coughs) That's the only way the two lions of the law are vanquished, is this lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, dies and conquers that which once enslaved, enslaved us. The reason we know this is because before Jesus says anything to the Jews about becoming free, he tells them the means by which their freedom would come in John 8, 28 when he says this, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. In other words, this entire conversation that Jesus has with these Jews about being free people is made possible because Jesus knows He's going to the cross. If Jesus doesn't go to the cross, this conversation, useless. It's, it's the sacrifice of the cross, the Son of Man being lifted up, that even makes it possible for these people to be free. And that's where Jesus is going. He's going to make them free because He's going to die for their sins. He sees in these people the line of legalism roaring. And He says, I'm the mightier lion and I'll show it by dying to defeat yours. So, Jesus' sacrificial death was not one of the many roads that led to freedom. It was the only road that led to freedom. That's what it means. It's the only way to get there. It's the only possible way to defeat the law of sin and death. So, this is what we have thus far. Jesus has addressed one part of their, their statement to him, right? We're not enslaved to anybody because we're kids of Abraham. Abraham's our daddy. And Jesus says, well, the problem is not that you're enslaved to a person. It's you're enslaved to a power. You're enslaved to sin because you sin. That's all you do. You sin, you sin, you sin, you sin. That's your master. That's your slave. And so he addresses that part. I'm talking about not the fact that you're related or not related to Abraham. I'm talking about your sin. But there's still the issue of what do we do with them saying they're Abraham's offspring? And what's interesting is when you read through John 8, Jesus answers that for them as well. So, what we have at the first part is you're enslaved because you love sin. And now, what we're going to see in the second part is you're not only enslaved because you love sin, it's actually your love of sin that proves that you belong to the wrong offspring of Abraham. So it's a cycle. It's a vicious circle. And this is how we we know. All right? John 8, 35 through 38. Jesus starts by saying this. And we're going to just take 35 through 37 right now. The slave does not remain in the house forever. So so Jesus says, you know the truth, the truth will set you free. The slave doesn't remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. So if you were here last week, what does this remind you of? Galatians 4, 21 through 31. This whole Hagar, Sarah, right? Ishmael and Isaac, they're both sons. Ishmael's born of the slave woman, Hagar, of the flesh. Isaac's born of the free woman, Sarah, of the promise. And something happens at the end of this story. Something happens once Isaac's of age to Ishmael, the son of the slave woman, the slave boy. He gets thrown out. He doesn't remain in the house of Abraham forever. In Genesis 21, he's thrown out. The son of the free woman forever remains. So, the slave doesn't remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son has set you free, you'll be free indeed. 37. I know that you're the offspring of Abraham. Now, this is amazing because Jesus is going to say in verse 37, I know you're the offspring of Abraham. He's going to say later on that you're not the offspring of Abraham. You're actually of your father, the devil. And then after he calls them the devil's kids, he's going to go back and say you're the offspring of Abraham. And so the question is this. Why does Jesus call them slaves and then reaffirm that they're Abraham's offspring? And the reason I think that he does it is because he's trying to get them to see that it is possible to be the offspring of Abraham and still be a slave, just like Ishmael. Ishmael was technically the offspring of Abraham, technically. 
But because his mother was a slave woman, Ishmael was a slave boy, Galatians 4.30. And this also explains why he says the son, the, the slave doesn't remain in the house forever. You should know this. And so what Jesus is saying, Jesus' response to their claim to be the offspring of Abraham goes something like this. Yes, you are the offspring of Abraham in as much as Ishmael is the offspring of Abraham. But remember, the son of the slave woman does not remain in the house. He and his mother are thrown out. So right now, you are Abraham's children. But you're not descended from Isaac. You're descended from Ishmael. And you're a slave because your mom was a slave. So, get this back in order here. Now the question becomes this. How do you differentiate between the offspring of Abraham that was born of the slave woman and the offspring of Abraham that was born of the free woman? And I think this is a very good question because both Isaac and Ishmael received circumcision. The sign that God gave to Abraham, covenantal sign that he belonged to God. I'm your God, you're my people circumcised. He circumcised Ishmael, he circumcises Isaac. One's a son, truly a son, an heir. The other's not. This is the way Jesus answers the question in verses 37 through 40, right? Because if you're a Jew, think about this, if you're a Jew, you've grown up learning that part of your identity in being the offspring of Abraham is your circumcision, your adherence to the law, your Jewish dietary restrictions, the observance of the Sabbath. All of these things make you inherently Jewish and make you children of Abraham. All right? But now Christ comes on the scene and he, and he hints that, yeah, you are kind of Abraham's offspring, but you look a lot, lot more like Ishmael than you do Isaac. And so the question is, okay, how does Jesus differentiate between their, you know, to, to, what, to what offspring they belong? And this is what, this is what the way Jesus answered it, answers it in verses 37 through 40. I know that you're offspring of Abraham. I know this, Jesus says. Yet, but there's a problem. You seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. And the answer to him, Abraham's our father. Abraham's our father. Why do you keep talking about us having different daddies? We have the same dad. Jesus said to them, and here's their main problem. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did, but now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. And so what did Abraham do? What works that Abraham did that they're not doing? And I think what we see is this in John 8, 56. Jesus tells the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham, when he saw me, was thrilled. He was thrilled to see me. But when you saw me, you wanted to kill me. You're not happy that I'm here like Abraham is. When you saw my, de when you saw my day, <coughs> jealousy rose up in your heart. You felt threatened. You had the wrong motives. You had the wrong desires about me. Abraham had the right ones. You're not Abraham's kids. If you were, you would be just as happy as Abraham was when he saw my day. Your fruit says that you don't belong to him. You belong to someone else. True offspring of Abraham are not decided nor determined by their circumcision. Pauline principle, right? Nor their strict adherence to the law. Rather, true descendants of Abraham will be judged by whether or not they place their faith in and rejoice in Jesus like their father Abraham did. That's how you become a child of Abraham. Jews are in slavery. The Jewish people that he was speaking of are in slavery because of their sin. And it's precisely because of their sin that they are not descendants of Abraham. That's the vicious cycle. It's the, the, the reason, the, their love for sin is the reason that they are not descendants of Abraham. And since they love sin and are not descendants of Abraham, they're in slavery to their sin. The law of sin and death is a vicious cycle of sin. That's all it is. There's just no escaping it. This is what Jesus walked into. He walked into a group of people that weren't Abraham's children because they loved sin. And he walked into a group of people that would never become Abraham's children because they love sin. 
Without his death on the cross, that is their reality. No hope. There's no hope. There's no other way for them to become a child of Abraham. Jesus walks in this cyclical notion of sin and sin and death and death and death. And the only way it's broken is him dying. That's what it means to be under the law of sin and death. Living under the law is opposite of living under divine blessing. Living under the law of sin and death is living under divine curse because divine blessing only happens when one keeps the law. You go and you read this list of divine blessing and divine curse that happens in in the book of Deuteronomy. If you do this, you will be blessed. If you don't do this, you will be cursed. And the problem is that the entire, the totality of the human order, except for Jesus Christ, live under divine curse because they can't do what they need to do for divine blessing. Sin reigns through the law. Sin reigns through the law and all these people get a curse after curse after curse after curse because sin is not broken. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Galatians 3.10 But there's a big but here. Galatians 3.13 But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The reason that the power of sin held sway under the old law is because the old law was void of that perfect sacrifice that could completely remove the penalty of our sin and eternally absolve us of our guilt. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, It was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to completely take away sin. And in those sacrifices, there was a reminder of sin every year. They were perpetual in nature and on purpose because it was to point to the one sacrifice, the one-time sacrifice, the one-time shedding of blood by Christ Jesus that would completely break the back of sin forever. But in the Old Testament sacrifice, there was just blood after blood after blood after blood. Millions of gallons of blood And a reminder that sin's not dealt with, sin's not dealt with, sin's not dealt with. But Christ comes and he makes one perfect sacrifice, one sufficient sacrifice, one drop of blood. It covers the sins of the entire world. Therefore, since there was no atonement, like definite atonement, complete atonement, The blessings of the new covenant like the Holy Spirit cannot be poured out by God and enjoyed by His people because His people were under a curse, the curse of sin. In order for the new covenant blessings to be enjoyed by us like the Holy Spirit, we couldn't be under divine curse. And we all were under divine curse because we couldn't keep the law. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And now in this new era of redemptive history, we don't live under divine curse. We live under divine blessing. Because our sin was removed and our guilt before God eternally pardoned. The blessings of the new covenant can be enjoyed because of the divine curse brought about by sin is removed in the person of Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice is is sufficient for all and efficient for those who are born of God. And as a result, exercise saving faith. Or to say it just a little differently, we no longer live under the law of sin and death because of the justification that has been declared over us in the person of Jesus Christ. We are justified in Jesus Christ. Being set free from the law, for freedom Christ has set us free, what Paul has in mind ultimately is justification. We know this because immediately afterwards in Galatians 5, he talks about, you have fallen away from grace, you who would be justified by the law. In Galatians 2, he says, We are not, like you Gentiles, sinners by birth. But even we have believed in Jesus Christ in order that we might be justified. For by the works of the flesh, or works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. That's what he has in his mind. Justification. What flows from being declared righteous by God and being in the right standing in God. And this is most clearly seen in Romans 8, 1-4. through We're almost done. Here Paul says the same things in two different ways, and that is 
being declared righteous, justified in the eyes of God, leads to sanctification. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, this is what he says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to be set free. It means that God looks at you, even in the midst of your sin, and he says, no condemnation because the blood of the righteous one has covered you and the blood of the righteous one intercedes for you. Perpetually. No condemnation. That's freedom. And here's the evidence for it. For, this is the evidence that you have been justified. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Or to say it differently, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. There's justification. Sin is condemned in the flesh of Jesus. His righteousness is imputed to us. We're declared righteous by God because of the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross in our behalf. And this is the reason why. In order that the righteous requirement of the law, which is love, which I think that's where Paul's going to go in Galatians 5, and I think that's where he goes in the totality of Romans, is that our primary law-breaking grievance was that we did not love. We could not love, but Christ fulfills the righteous requirement of the law in us, which is love, and now through the Spirit, we love each other. All right? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So when Paul says, for freedom Christ has set us free, he has a mind of freedom from the old way of life, the, the way of life that's classified as the power of the law of sin or death, and the new way that Christ Jesus brought about by his sacrificial um, death and his glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, which is called the power of the Spirit of life. There are three implications, and we're done. Number one. The only type of sin that you can conquer is a sin of which you've been forgiven. That's what the entire Old Testament testifies to. That's what the, this entire sermon says this. You ready? It says that when, where there is no remission of sin, sin holds sway. The law, the law did not absolve. The sacrificial system did not take away the sin of the person that committed the sin. This didn't take it away. The blood of bulls and goats didn't take it away. And as a result, there was never real, true victory as we know it today. But Christ came and He took all the sins on Himself, right? He takes all the sins on Himself. And then there's forgiveness, there's pardon because of His sacrifice. And so now we go about conquering sin because in the person of Jesus Christ, our sin has been forgiven. And many of you have probably grown up thinking about sin this way. Well, I'll conquer this sin, and once I conquer it, then God will forgive me. Because I don't do it anymore. He'll forgive me. He'll be so proud. He'll be so probably, he might even give me a plaque. I don't know. He'll give me a crown. Maybe I won't have to throw it at his feet. Maybe I can wear it because I conquered That's not the way the Lord works. He first says, I'm going to forgive you completely. Not because you conquered your sin, but so that you can now conquer your sin. If you could conquer your sin without forgiveness, then there was no need for Christ to die. There was no need. Christ died and offered forgiveness so that the sin could be conquered. Not the other way around. Which means that when we fight sin, we fight it with a view to the finished work of Christ on our behalf. We, when we go to God in prayer, when we fall short, we plead with Jesus to, to continually cover us by His blood and to make intercession for us because He is the righteous one who lives to intercede for us. Number two, once we're free from the power of sin and death, we now live under the power of the Spirit of life. Or we serve in a new way of the Spirit, which means... We live in light of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Sounds like all the applications are the same, right? It's because they are. It's because they are the same. This is the Christian life. Live in light of what has been done for you in Christ Jesus. And when you don't do that, you've missed the point of grace. You've fallen from it. 
so, it's the implications and applications are so simple. Live in light of what's been done for you. Because if you don't, if you don't live that way, you're sinfully self-sufficient. Sinfully self-sufficient. Keep the sacrifice of Christ at the forefront of your minds. Glory in all that God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Which brings us to the third application, implication. The same great danger exists for believers and unbelievers. And that's this. Not trusting the sufficiency of Christ. For the unbeliever, it looks different than it does for the believer. For the unbeliever, not trusting in the sufficiency of Christ is stiff-arming the sacrifice that Christ made on your behalf and Christ promised to satisfy your soul completely with His mercy and goodness and loving kindness and saying, no, I'll go to another source, namely sin. I'll go there for my satisfaction. You can't satisfy me. I don't trust you. I'm going there. And so in their going to sin for satisfaction, they will be condemned for their unbelief. That's what, that's the fruit. Most sins like lying and fornication, all these things are symptoms of unbelief. Just don't trust God. I don't trust God to do what he said he'd do. So I'll go through a host of other things and it's because I don't believe him. But if you're a Christian, your danger is no different than the unbeliever. No different. Unbelievers don't trust God to satisfy their deepest needs. And as believers, for some reason, we have a hard time trusting God to cover and absolve us of our deepest sins through the person of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what's happening in the book of Galatians. These people begin by the Spirit. And somewhere along the line, false teachers comes in, come, come in and they say, the sacrifice of Jesus isn't enough. You need to add to it. Not much. Just, you know, a little snip snip down there. That'll do. That'll do. And you, ooh, maybe that is the way I should be a child of Abraham. Maybe Christ's sacrifice wasn't enough. And that's the battle for us as believers, is trusting the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice for our sins and not trying to diminish from the glory of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross by adding to it. Whatever that might be. So that is the fight of faith. If you're a child of God, live in light of what God's done for you through the person of Jesus Christ. Celebrate your freedom, for freedom Christ has set you free. And if you're not a child of God, and that means if you're not trusting actively in Jesus to meet the deepest needs of your soul, why do you go to the well that holds no water? Why do you dump the bucket into the well and you go to drink this sparkling water while it turns to gravel and sand in your mouth? Jesus is the water of life. He's living water, and whoever drinks from him will never thirst again. Won't you believe and trust in the promises of Jesus? Let's pray. God, help us to trust you. Help us to love you. Thank you for making us free in Christ Jesus. For those of us who are in Christ, help us not to add to what you've already done for us. Help us not to think like, I'm going to stop. I've, I've got to stop this, this, this sin so that I can be forgiven by you and, be, and have victory over the sin. Help us to, to go about fighting the fight of faith in a different way. Help us to serve not under the way of the written code, but of the Spirit. Help us to look towards what Christ has done on our behalf at the cross and say, wow, if you didn't withhold your own son from us, how much more then will you give us all things? Help us to remind ourselves of the great and, the great and gracious promises that you give us through your word and to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Help our unbelief, God. Help us know you'll satisfy our need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.